joined today by J.R. Romano. What a weekend. Well, actually, I should say, what a week for um, the state of Connecticut. Uh, I don't know whether to say it was it was disappointing. Um, actually, that's probably a good word to describe uh, the last few weeks here in the state of Connecticut. Uh, I guess what, what should we tackle first? Let's let's we're, we're going to touch on what's what's going on in Virginia. I actually um, have a, a good buddy of mine. He's the former uh, Republican Party chairman, the state chairman in Virginia. He's going to be calling in John Whitbeck. He's got a some insight on what's happening out there. But we're going to we're going to touch on that a little later. First, I want to talk a little bit about. Uh, this uh, one of the big things I think uh, is forced regionalization of schools. That's that's something that has been proposed by the Democrats in the General Assembly. Um, now they're they're claiming it's a cost saving measure, which in reality it's a, it's a backdoor way to create county government, and and frankly it takes choice away from parents. Um, the state is going to further and further control not only. Um, you know, the idea they're going to take more money from us and you'll get it back, which we never do. I think right now the state of Connecticut pays about 35% of pilot, which is payment in lieu of taxes to municipalities. Uh, and there's actually a state law that mandates they pay 75% and they don't. They pay about 35% reimbursement to towns and cities. So whenever you see these forced regionalizations, and let me play you a quote by a Democrat state legislator um, uh, right here. Listen to this. If, if regionalism is what we have to do to make education in the state of Connecticut work, then we need to figure out how to make that work. And I know that forcing people to do things is not always the right way to go, but sometimes we have to help people get there because they're not going to get there on their own. That is the epitome of the Democratic Party. We are going to tell you what's best for you, and if you don't agree, we'll force you to do it. And that doesn't matter whether it's uh, constitutional rights, whether it's education, quality of education, uh, the food we eat. Uh, this is how Democrats view the world. They're now um, basically emboldened um, and, and have this, what they believe, moral superiority and, and, and have the right to tell us all how to live and tell us all what's right for us and what needs to be done. Meanwhile, they don't take responsibility for the failures uh, that has led us to the point of bankruptcy. So it's almost as like we as legislators, we as Democrats, who've led this state for the last 35 years, are not going to take responsibility that we didn't pay into the teachers' retirement fund, we didn't cultivate a, 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 a an environment for successful businesses, so our tax receipts are down, our debt is up, so we're going to force you to regionalize, regionalize, and if you don't like it, too bad. That's literally what they're saying to every parent in the state. If you don't like this, too bad. We know what's best for you. I, I mean, it, it, it's appalling. And frankly, what, what is even more disturbing, and, and I get criticized for saying this all the time, a lot of these communities that now have newly elected Democrats uh, are wealthier communities who are going to be, or who are the ones that are going to be forced into realization. They're going to be the ones paying the, 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 the high price of state mandate or state governed school systems, which I, I'm not even going to go down that road because they can't even <laughs> they can't even pave the roads properly, right? They run out of money doing that. How, how are they going to be able to uh, – anyway. But these communities that thought they were punishing Trump, right, all of these wealthy people who are so uh, – the line that I always use is that they're, they're, um, they can afford to be offended. They're the ones that are now going to pay by – the, the, the Democrat legislature is going to strip them of choices when it comes to, to their to their children's education. Um, they're going to strip uh, municipal budgets, right? Because the the reimbursement rate is going to drop because Ned Lamont can't can't nearly give the municipal aid that he was. So you know, there's all these things that are that are going to affect communities like Wil, uh, Wilton, Reading, Ridgefield. Uh, Glastonbury, um, Madison. I mean, these are communities who voted is in protest of Donald Trump, and all they ended up doing was punishing themselves and the middle class, because obviously the, the Democrats are pushing for things that are going to be more expensive. And, and my favorite in, in this fight, because there's so many, I mean, we're, we're talking grocery tax. Uh, Ned Lamont is, is floating the idea of a grocery tax, you know, a 2% tax. And, and what we've looked at in our office is that if you're a, if you're a single mom working, you, you live in Meriden and you work in Hartford, we actually calculated um, out, you know, if you're, I think it was like $149 a week in groceries and tolls, just those two things. So there's a, the American Tax Foundation list Connecticut is the second most burdensome tax state in the country for state and local taxes. We pay about a 12 0.6% of our earnings in state and local taxes. So when you do the calculation, 
and I don't have the exact number in front of me, but it's something like $7,300 of this single mom, if she owns a condo, say, in Meriden, Connecticut, and she lives in Hartford. So she pays, on average, about $7,300 uh, a year, because uh, I actually did the calculation if she's a teacher in Hartford, for example. I, did the, I, I looked at what the average teacher salary was um, lo- and then looked at the, the, mile, the mileage and, and at four cents a mile, which is that's the medium of where the state is projecting the, the tolls will cost. This single mom will pay from $7,300 a year in state and local taxes up to $8,200. So just from groceries and tolls, just from groceries and tolls, the state is going to take about $1,000 more from, from a single mom living in Meriden driving to Hartford. I, I mean, this is where we are. And this is all a byproduct of bad public policy that has been forced down our throats by the Democratic Party. I'm calling on all of you, anyone listening to this, even if you are in the Democratic Party, even if you disagree with me, to not see how devastating these policies are I get the idea, you know, we always talk about tribalism, like Democrat versus Republican, but the, 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 the facts are the facts. I mean, it, it is what it is. The, the state is becoming more and more expensive because the Democrats refuse to accept responsibility and cut things and come up with different strategies. It's just tax, 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 and people can't afford to live here. And the funniest part about it, and my favorite, is a guy that literally went to Ned Lamont's um, – Joe Scarsborough, who lives, he was a congressman in Florida. He, you know, he's on MSNBC. He lives in New Canaan. I think it's New Canaan or Ridgefield, one of those, one of those towns. He went to Ned Lamont's inaugural ball. Sporting Ned, at least it would seem that way to me. And now he's leaving for Florida. He is going to be one of these guys that never sells his Connecticut home. But they're literally living. He's doing his show from Florida now, so that he can get the six month plus one day. So that, to me, this is like a really rich guy who's out at dinner with his friends and family. This is Ned Lamont, right? So you a big dinner table, and everyone's out, and they're all eating. And then when the bill comes, they all walk out, and they look at the busboy, and they say, you got to pay, pal. Sorry, you, you can't afford to leave because that's what's happening right now to the middle class of this state. And I hope people wake up to that fact. But on to uh, – let's talk about what's happening with the Virginia governor. And I'm going to bring on, on my, my buddy John Whitbeck, the former state party chairman out in Virginia, to talk a little bit about the nuance. But, but what I want to highlight – and, and I, I mean, I can't even describe – over the weekend, I had called on Ned Lamont to, one, uh, call on the, the governor of Virginia to resign. And if he refused to resign, to, to put in a travel ban. Now, all, there's all these Democrats that are arguing, and they're, they're all saying all these things, um, you know, that frankly, it, it doesn't change the racist actions of this governor. Right, they're all arguing over this one and this one, and, and some in some instances, you know, these these references are, are all up for interpretation. But this one is not. This photo, and and it's anyone that can be defending this guy, it's literally like four people, and Ned Lamont's quote in regards to this is so milk toast. It's so I, I can't even. I can't even explain how weak this comment is in the face of racism. Let me read it to you. And by the way, the sentence for a guy that went to Harvard is just, it doesn't even make sense to me. It's kind of an odd sentence. You ready? My focus is on advocating on behalf of every resident of Connecticut. I ask Governor Northam to search his conscience to see if he believes he is in a position to do the same for Virginia. I have a hard time, given everything that we've learned over the past three days, believing that he is. Ned. I don't even say, I, I wish that, you know, on Twitter, some, you know, there, there's a grammar or an English teacher out there that would correct this. But for a Harvard guy, you kind of scratch your head. And the worst part, he falls short of calling for his resignation. Nancy Pelosi's called for this guy to resign. Governor Raimondo in Rhode Island has called for, so uh, it's not even like Ned has to, Go out on a limb here, right? There are the national NAACP in Virginia. The, the Democratic Party of Virginia is called for him. To I, you know what? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to end up repeating myself. I'm, I'm getting fired up over this because of how weak and, and lack of leader, uh, leadership that Ned has shown. One of the other things I want to point out, and, and this is the hypocrisy of, of this whole thing, is – is the idea that, you know, Dan Malloy, based on a, a public policy out in Indiana that, that they morally disagreed with, you know, they banned travel and, you know, the, these reporters on Twitter were talking about how it was a partial ban. and all. It doesn't matter. Partial ban. Thanks for pointing out. But at the end of the day, 
what this governor of Virginia did was wrong, and he needs to be held accountable. And this is where everyone is falling short, and they, and they want to nitpick. But, but the truth of the matter is, the more that we stay focused on nonsense, I, it, it's, it's, it's such, so hypocritical. And here's Ned Lamont ran on this idea of Connecticut values, and we have to stand for something. and all. Yeah, and he falls short. He falls short every time when it comes to making, making tough decisions. And this one isn't even that tough. He's one of like four people that haven't called for him to resign. I mean, it is absolutely ludicrous. I mean, how about the fact when, when here's, this is the same guy that when he finally decided to leave a country club that had uh, restrictions based on race uh, in Greenwich. I mean, he, and, and by the way, we're talking like 2006. Here. We're not talking like 1986, right? We're talking 2006, Ned Lamont. He chose to leave uh, this country club down in Greenwich because, and because obviously he had political ambitions. But here's what he said. Um, and this is from the New York Times. Uh, uh, Mr. Lamont said the club excluded people because it was so expensive and also said he was a bit concerned that many of its members were white. It's not as diverse as it should be, Mr. Lamont said. I didn't pay as much attention to that before the race began to tell you the truth. I mean, this is, uh, instead of saying it's wrong, he just, he keeps playing this soft game where he's not willing to kind of take a stand. It's, uh, this is ludicrous. Absolutely ludicrous. Let me let me bring on my my, my dear friend, uh, uh, former state party chair chairman uh, John Whitbeck uh, from the state of Virginia. All right. So uh, joining me now, former uh, Virginia Re- Republican state party chairman John Whitbeck. So John, tell me what is going on in Virginia. Well, you know, I don't think anybody has missed the story that broke on Friday. There was a uh, absolutely horrendous racist photograph that was placed in the yearbook on the page of our governor, Ralph Northam. He initially apologized, admitting that it was him in the picture, and has now since walked it back and said it's not him in the picture, and he's been wronged, and he intends to push it. So... Uh, it's, uh, everybody has called on him to resign Republican. I I was just going to ask that. I was just going to say, so uh, everyone from Nancy Pelosi to the NAAC to the old, didn't the Virginia democratic party, your counterpart in Virginia call for a second. Is that true? Yeah. They put out a tweet, uh, on Saturday that basically said, or actually I think it was Friday. We no longer support our governor. And of course, you know, he's a Democrat. So, uh, the actual Virginia Democrat Party disavowed him. So he is a man without a party, and he's been exposed for being a uh, racist, essentially. And with all the identity politics that he's played in the last couple of years, it's pretty amazing to uh, watch this unfold. Well, so that's actually, I was, I was actually going to joke, the only, the CNN did identify him as a Republican. Um, but yeah, um, I know, <laughs> fake news. So can you just explain to everyone in Connecticut that, that uh, Virginia actually has a, 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 an interesting rule when it comes to their governors, right? They, it's not like other states. Well, first of all, it's a one-term governor. We have a term limit of one term. So if the governor resigns, which we expect him still to do, we don't think he can hang on to this. But if the governor resigns, then the lieutenant governor takes his place, and the president pro tem of the Senate becomes the acting Lieutenant governor in power only. What I mean by that is we don't have a succession plan for lieutenant governor. The president pro tem of the Senate just has the vote and presides over the Senate. Uh, so it's we would be without a lieutenant governor for three years at this point. Oh, wow. Yes. And if and, the and, lieutenant governor resigns and the attorney general, uh, in other words, if, if both of them resign, the attorney general takes over as, as, uh, uh, as governor. And so then the next, and, and I guess some, what happened today? Wasn't there something that broke today? This would be obviously Monday. Um, you, you had mentioned uh, that something just happened. Well, so the latest is that our lieutenant governor, Justin Fairfax, who would be the, the acting, well, not acting governor, he actually would be sworn in as governor, uh, he had a press conference today to address an allegation that in 2004 he committed sexual assault on a woman while at the Democrat National Convention. Uh, he denies it, uh, says it was a consensual relationship, 
And so now we're all just sort of sitting here in Virginia on all sides of the aisle thinking uh, that I don't know how much more we can we can see happen. I just, I've never seen anything like it. And Virginia politics can get pretty crazy at times. So what does it mean if, if this lieutenant governor doesn't survive? What, what, does that mean you guys will have a special? How does that work? The uh, attorney general would take over as governor. The president pro tem would take over as doing the job of lieutenant governor, even though he wouldn't technically be lieutenant governor. And the deputy attorney general would fill out the remainder of the attorney general's term. So there's not really a special election uh, part of this. Now, our Constitution has a, has a weird uh, uh, twist in it. That, that, so we have a statute that says the president pro tem takes over the, gov- the lieutenant governor's uh, powers, but the Constitution says that the, uh, the governor appoints the lieutenant governor. So you have two conflicting parts of Virginia law there. We're not really sure exactly how it will play out, but uh, we're not going to have any special elections anytime soon. We know that. That's unfortunate. So you uh, you think he will resign? And uh... I do. I don't see how you can possibly be effective. I mean, we, the Republicans control the state Senate and the state House. And so uh, what is the governor going to do, even though he, he uh, won by a landslide, unfortunately? You know, what is he going to do? Is he going, you know, what moral high ground does he have to cut deals? I mean, he's basically he has no party. Um, the African American community is absolutely beside beside itself. I mean, the NAACP has been very vocal. Lamont Bagley, the uh, Virginia Legislative Black Caucus Chair, has been very vocal. Um, you know, and rightfully so. I mean, it, it, Governor Northam is a racist. Period. Um, he should have resigned Friday when this broke. Nobody believes that it wasn't him in the photograph. And uh, you know, for all the accusations he made against the Republican nominee Ed Gillespie. For governor, uh, you know, during the 2017 election, uh, calling him a racist for attacking MS. Didn't he? Yeah, I was going to say, didn't he have a controversial ad, John? Wasn't there some ad that he that Northam put put out? He did, and it was a uh, Latino group that put out an ad of basically a truck with a Gillespie sticker uh, chasing minority children, like to run them over. It was the most appalling thing I've ever seen in, in uh, politics, and, and that was uh, that was the ad. But but no, and, and pretty much everybody disavowed it. But you, we all know what was really going on there. Well, and, well, and I have to just have to tell you, John. So I, you and I had spoke on Friday. I wanted to kind of get the scoop um, on what was happening. And, and here in Connecticut, I, I actually challenged our governor because you had told me you you didn't think he was going to resign. So I, I challenged our governor. Uh, to not only call for his resignation, but if he failed to resign to do the, you know, the, the, the travel ban, you know, the thing that Democrats were doing uh, uh, to try to make uh, 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 some point against Mike Pence. I don't know if you remember that or not. But what, what I find so fascinating here in Connecticut, and I'd be curious your opinion of this, uh, the Democrats here are actually defending your governor. They were there, you know. If you look at Ned Lamont's tweet, and and um, we're going to be sending a graphic out about it, but it was this milk toast thing. Like he should really take in consideration and, and take into stock if he can be an effective leader. But there was no call for him to resign. There was no there was no outrage over this this photo. And and just from your perspective, being in Virginia and seeing what's happened with Virginia's with Democrats in Virginia, what would you say to these Democrats here in Connecticut? Well, you know, it, there, there were two layers of this. The first layer was everybody and their brother saying, you got to get out of the governor's mansion, resign now, except for our senators, Mark Warner and Tim Kaine. And then after Northam held his press conference on Saturday, which was an utter disaster. Yeah, for those uh, that haven't watched it, it, I strongly encourage. It, it's, you know, I, I, I oftentimes very critical of the White House and their ability to crisis management. This is the worst crisis management I've ever seen. It's not really, you know, I hate analyzing this from a political perspective because it's so horrifically racist and you know, every, uh, you know, fiber in my being despises what, what Ralph Northam did with this disgusting display. But it's, right, there's no misinterpretation, it's, right? That, that's yeah. why I keep trying to explain it. There's no misinterpretation. You know, if someone, someone says something or confuses something, you can argue what the intent was. And the, there is no way to, to delineate what this was, was racist. Um, 
And and I think that's where you know, what makes me laugh when you're fighting with the Democrats on, the, on particularly in my state about how they're defending this guy. I just can't believe it. Right. Well, and so if, if your governor is really seriously not calling for his resignation, he's one of maybe two people, the governor's wife included, that haven't called on him to resign. It's just it's like unbelievable. Wow. Well. Yeah. Well, I may just and have I, to quote you on that, John. <laughs> you may be in a tweet. Well, uh, it, it, it is it is unbelievable that um, uh, we are where we are. It's just an embarrassment for our state. We need to expect more from our leaders, and um, I just I don't know where we where we how we got to this place, other than the fact that Ralph Northam believes uh, that it's okay to appear in blackface or the KKK robe, and, and that's uh, unfortunately where we're at. Well, anyway, I, I appreciate you jumping on. Um, you know, we have uh, lots of problems here in Connecticut, and, and I'm sure Virginia, uh, similarly with uh, Democrat governors. Um, but again, as always, and you're going to be missed at the RNC, man. Oh uh, well, it's uh, it was tough not being there for the winter meeting in Albuquerque. But, uh, you know, it's uh, uh, it's a great organization. We're doing awesome right now, and uh, I'm really excited for uh, the party's chances this year and our off-year elections in Virginia in light of all that's happened in, uh, in 2020 as well. All right, man. Well, I appreciate it. Thank you again. John Whitbeck, former right. party chairman in Virginia.